After months of waiting, I have finally gotten my hands on one of the most exciting new luxury vehicles in the United States. It's the all new Lincoln Aviator. This is Lincoln's midsize three row crossover and the direct Lincoln competitor to the BMW X5 and Mercedes Benz GLE. But unlike the other American competitor in this segment, the Aviator is the one that really takes the fight to the Germans because the XT6, let's be honest, was a little bit disappointing when it launched. It manages to be more expensive than the Aviator, be less powerful, and be front wheel drive. And that's what makes the Aviator a little bit interesting because this is a rear wheel drive competitor. The decision to move back to rear wheel drive makes the Aviator very different than the MKT that it replaces. The other thing that we see in the Lincoln lineup lately is a serious dedication to interior design and refinement. We first saw that in the Lincoln Navigator. All of that has been applied to the interior of the Aviator and also the Lincoln Corsair, the smallest of the Lincoln crossovers at the moment in the United States. Rear wheel drive transmissions can handle a lot more power than current front wheel drive transaxles. And that's one of the reasons that standard horsepower in this model is 400, much more similar to the German competition in terms of performance. But a little bit more important than performance in a way is that modern Lincolns really have a serious dedication to interior refinement. We first saw that in the Navigator. The Aviator takes a lot of styling and design cues from that larger Lincoln SUV. And then of course we have the Lincoln Corsair, the smallest of the Lincoln crossovers, which definitely has a significant focus on interior refinement. But before I get ahead of myself, let's talk about the design. We have full LED headlamp standard, LED turn signals as well, LED fog lights down there at the bottom, and then we have this distinctive Lincoln grille up front. It's similar to what we see in the smaller and larger Lincolns. It is a little bit controversial. This kind of reminds me perhaps of a sort of a bucky tooth beaver right here with these little chrome sections right there. Be sure and let me know what you think about the design down there in the comment section. Lincoln has done a good job integrating the Lincoln logo into just about everything in the vehicle, so these little chrome elements here are all little Lincoln logo shapes, and then we have an illuminated Lincoln star right there in the middle, similar to what we see in the Mercedes lineup. Thanks to the rear wheel drive platform, the side profile of the Aviator is certainly more similar to the European competition than something like the Acura MDX. You'll really notice that the front tires push an awful lot further forward. We have a shorter front overhang. We definitely have a longer hood proportion as well. At 199.3 inches long, this slots almost exactly between a BMW X5 and a BMW X7 in terms of overall length. This is five inches longer than an X5, four inches shorter than an X7. The X5 is probably the most appropriate competitor because in terms of price, the Aviator is pretty close. But unlike the BMW X5, all Aviators are gonna have a third row. In the X5, the third row is optional. Logically, this is also a direct competitor to the Audi Q7, which is almost exactly the same length, the Cadillac XT6, the Volvo XC90, etc. Just like the Lincoln Navigator is the luxury cousin to the Ford Expedition, this is the luxury cousin to the Ford Explorer, and it benefits from a lot of the R&D that Ford did to transition the Explorer to rear wheel drive as well. But as we see in the Lincoln Navigator, the interior is very, very unique to the Aviator. Lincoln decided to go all in on electric door latches. So this door handle does not move. There's a button on the back of it. We pull that to open the door and then there's an electronic release on the inside. We also get soft closed doors, but only for the front doors. Those automatically close right like that, but the back door, you'll have to do that yourself. Lincoln decided to keep the hatch very vertical in the Aviator. That really helps improve third row headroom as well as cargo practicality. We have full LED tail lamp modules here and the turn signals are amber, which is a nice touch. The backup lights are over here on the hatch and then we have this LED bar that connects one side to the other. I think the most interesting touch back here are the exhaust tips, however. Depending on exactly how you want to look at these, Lincoln is giving us an interesting twist on real versus fake exhaust tips. Instead of giving us a plastic cutout that looks like an exhaust tip like we see in a lot of modern Audis, these are actually connected to the muffler. But exhaust gases don't flow right out the back right here. Instead, you'll notice that we have a small black section in there. That's actually the real exhaust outlet. The exhaust is coming out right under these chrome tips. That means that the Aviator has quad exhaust tips, but the exhaust is not coming out of the quad exhaust tips exactly as seen. Instead, this design helps keep these all nice and shiny, whereas the exhaust gas is actually coming out the bottom. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Do you think this is a really neat design or do you feel a little bit cheated? Going in a slightly different direction than the Germans, Lincoln decided to make most of their driver assistance technologies standard on the Aviator. The Copilot 360 system, which gives us forward collision warning, pedestrian detection, and autonomous braking is standard. We also get blind spot monitoring and lane keeping assistance as well. Up until recently, if you wanted these kinds of driver assistance technologies standard on your next luxury vehicle, you had to look at vehicles like Acura or Lexus. But we are seeing a slow change in some other brands. Lincoln is spearheading the fight on the American side, and then Volvo has decided to make a lot of these safety systems standard for 2021. On the other hand, if you're looking at some of the German options, you should know that many of these systems are going to be optional. 
When you first open the hood of the Aviator, you may be surprised that we don't have some enormous sheet of plastic like we find in a lot of the luxury competitors. Instead, we have a Medusa's head of tubes, and somewhere under there lives a 3-liter twin-turbo V6 engine. It produces 400 horsepower and 415 pound-feet of torque, and you'll find that engine in every Aviator sold in the United States. But if you want more than 400 horsepower, you do have an option. It's the plug-in hybrid that we're looking at today. That bumps things up to 494 horsepower and a whopping 630 pound-feet of torque, thanks to an electric motor that's sandwiched between the engine and the standard 10-speed automatic transmission. Rear-wheel drive is standard if you choose the non-hybrid model, but you can get all-wheel drive, and all-wheel drive is standard if you choose the plug-in hybrid. Logically, fuel economy is going to be the highest in the hybrid. This comes in at 23 miles per gallon combined. If you choose the all-wheel drive non-hybrid model, it drops down to 20 miles per gallon combined. You might be wondering, why is there not a huge difference between the two? Well, logically, we have an awful lot of power, so this plug-in hybrid system is about giving you more of everything, along with a little bit of electric range. And this is going to weigh about 900 pounds more than the non-hybrid model. That's where a lot of that difference comes in. The hybrid and non-hybrid model use essentially the same 10-speed automatic transmission, but another important thing to know is that the hybrid model deletes the torque converter. Instead, we get a clutch pack and we get the electric motor, and that means that in some situations, this is not going to be as smooth driving as the non-hybrid model. As a result of its plug-in hybridization and Lincoln's decision to focus on performance rather than overt efficiency with their hybrid system, you could logically say that the most direct competitor for this model is the Volvo XC90 T8 that we recently reviewed. But even though Volvo used to be under the Ford umbrella, the two vehicles have very different philosophies when it comes to plug-in hybridization. This uses a very traditional rear-wheel drive drivetrain. We have the same 10-speed automatic transmission that we find in all of Lincoln's rear-wheel drive vehicles. We have a twin-turbo V6 engine up front and a mechanical all-wheel drive system. Charging happens via a standard J1772 connector right here behind door number two that charges the onboard 13.6 kilowatt hour battery pack 13 kilowatt hours appear to be usable, and it's charged via an onboard 3.6 kilowatt charger. Doing the math, that means if you have access to a level two charger, it'll take about four hours to fill this completely, and that theoretically would give you 21 miles of electric range, but getting a little bit ahead of myself, a real world range figure on this has been about 15 to 16 miles. After the battery is exhausted, theoretically you'd be getting 23 miles per gallon. As you'd expect out of a luxury car, front seat comfort is excellent, and these seats in the top end trim move in a million different ways. One of the more interesting ways are these split thigh cushion extensions here. They're controlled via the controls over here on the door. I thought that it was kind of a gimmicky thing when I first saw this. Why would you want the left leg or the right leg to go further out than the other one? But I actually have discovered that I like this because if you're on a longer road trip, you can have this cushion in if you tend to sit with your leg like that a little bit more. Well, the other leg is out towards the brake pedal and accelerator pedal. I'd love to hear from someone that has a modern Lincoln with this split thigh cushion extension. Let me know if that's what you're doing with your Lincoln or if there's some other reason that I have overlooked here. We also have a powered tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion and the driver's seat has exactly the same range of motion as the passenger seat. The seat controls are over here on the door. We have four-way adjustable headrests, seat back right there. This is the seat back curvature button. We then have the controls for the extending thigh cushions and everything else about the seat, all the lumbar support, inflatable bolsters, massage, all that is done by the infotainment system. We press this button for a shortcut into that. The Aviator is available with either a six-passenger or a seven-passenger interior. The model that we're taking a look at today is the six-passenger model. So if I scoot over to this side, we have a large fixed center console between the seats. Second row seats slide forward and backward to help you apportion the space more equitably between the three rows. This front seat's all the way back in its tracks, and with the second row all the way back in its tracks, you can see I still have about three and a half inches of legroom left. Second row seats also had some fold down armrests there because the center console does not have any soft padding. It has a roller top cover and then some additional storage cubbies. We'll take a look at that in a bit. There are a few things I should mention back here. I was a little bit surprised that we don't have power side shades with the price tag of this particular aviator, but I am happy to see that we do have ventilated second row seats in addition to heated seats. The shade for the panoramic moonroof is controllable from the rear seat console as well as from the front, but for some reason the third row does not have any window shades at all. On the other hand, the aviator does get four zone automatic climate control. You can control the third row and second row zones from the touch screen right here at the back of the front center console. Hopping into the third row is pretty easy. The second row seats have an electric tilt slide functionality. It's worth noting that you cannot leave a child seat latched into place and still tilt and slide those seats forward. That's pretty unusual in the luxury segment for that feature to be offered. Pretty much just the Infiniti QX60 offers it. Even safety obsessed Volvo does not have a function like that. In addition to having a large amount of combined legroom, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that seat all the way back. It is completely back in its tracks because the front seat's back in its tracks just to give you an idea of what's going on. My knees are just barely touching that seat back. 
but I could very easily adjust the front seat and the second row seat. For me, it's six feet tall and certainly be comfortable back here in the third row because there is an enormous amount of headroom back here. Sitting in a very natural position, I have about an inch of headroom left between the top of my head and the ceiling. If I try and lean my head back, however, the cutout for that rear hatch does get in the way. I can't quite put my head back there to the headrest. Thanks to the combination of legroom and headroom that we find back here, the third row is certainly more comfortable than what we find in the BMW X5 or the Mercedes-Benz GLE or the Acura MDX. It's also a little bit more comfortable than the Volvo XC90, which does a pretty reasonable job, even though it's a little bit smaller than this. And to be perfectly honest, the three row crossover Lexus just isn't worth mentioning. That third row is completely unusable. Lincoln also did a great job of miniaturizing some of the rear seat components, like the powered rear seat function, which we don't find in all the luxury competition, typically because it takes up so much space behind the third row. Another thing that I was surprised to find here, even in this plug-in hybrid model, is a temporary spare tire. Although my preference is certainly for a full-size spare tire, most of the luxury competition simply doesn't offer a spare at all. Lincoln locates the battery for the plug-in hybrid system completely under the aviator, not in the cargo area. That means that we get the same 18.3 cubic feet of storage space behind the third row that we find in the non-hybrid model. And if you fold the third row, as I suspect that most people probably will, you'll have access to 41.8 cubic feet of storage space. The cargo area is certainly one of the major selling points for the aviator. You'll notice that we have a lot of room right back here on the rear cargo load shelf. And if I lift this up, we have a ton of additional storage space right under there as well. You can see that you can definitely put some of those larger roller bags in there. Thanks to the generously sized cargo area, the temporary spare tire, and the power folding third row seats, I'm going to give this cargo area 9 out of 10 points in my exclusive trunk comfort index. One downside to this cargo area, however, if you get the roller cargo cover, it will only go into position between the third row and the hatch, which is a really tiny little area. There is no way to stick it between the second row seats. So if you have the third row seats folded most of the time, the cargo cover is not going to cover your cargo. On the other hand, we do have a power hatch. Ow. The third row doesn't power fold when the hatch is closed. And I don't have the key to get out, so I'm gonna have to, ow, climb, oh, oh, that is tricky. Oh, butt to the camera, sorry. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end trim of Aviator, but regardless of which trim you look at, interior parts quality is definitely excellent and certainly an asset to the Aviator. This model has this Alcantara style headliner, it's a simulated suede, and you can see that we have a ton of speakers in here. There's some speakers just in front of the driver and front passenger. Similar speakers just in front of the second row. You can see those manual window shades right there. The stitching pattern on the second row seats and the front row seats looks pretty similar, but you can see that the front row has a very different design. My only complaint is that the back of this seat right there, visible from the second row, is not quite as attractive as it could be. But the reason that we see this separate module is because of the way this seat moves. Pardon the wobbly camera as I try and reach over to access the seat controls, but you'll see that this shoulder section goes forward and backwards so you can effectively change the curvature of the seat. And then we have a four-way adjustable headrest that goes in and out, telescopes right there up and down as well. Then the seat has the typical ranges of motion along with inflatable side bolsters on the seat back and seat bottom cushion. Then you can see those thigh cushion extensions there as well. Moving over to the doors, there's a ton of stitched material going on. We have the leather armrest there, which is soft touch, soft touch upper section of the door, metal speaker grills. You'll see those seat controls over there as well. One thing that we do find in some of the European competition that we don't see in here is a memory selection over there for the front passenger. We then have storage compartments down there at the bottom of the door and all the materials on the door are soft touch plastics, including the plastics down there at the bottom. Moving over to the dashboard, we have the same stitch materials that we found on the driver's door, some shiny black trim below that matches what's on the door and then wood trim above that. There's a small Lincoln logo over there on the passenger side. And then above that, the upper section of the dashboard is a soft touch injection molded dashboard that has then been after stitched. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a standard infotainment system that's just over 10 inches. This is running software that's very similar to other Lincoln and Ford vehicles at the moment. As you can see, it supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. We can click over there to get to the Lincoln menu. My one complaint about this system is that the processor is still a little on the slow side. I found the responsiveness a little bit annoying when I wanted to access especially the driver or passenger seat massage feature, a feature that I think is really an asset to the aviator, but it is really sluggish sometimes. This software is certainly more sluggish than what we find in modern BMW and Mercedes models and even modern Volvo models now that they've updated the processor in their census system. The engine start stop buttons right over there. Again, more stitched goods right there, two large air vents. We have some direct access buttons to certain vehicle settings here. This is the 360 degree camera button, automated parking button, and then this brings us over to some of the driver assistance systems like auto hold and traction control. Below that, we have Lincoln's distinctive piano style shifter. 
park, reverse, neutral, and then drive. They're all little toggles right there. More real wood trim. The controls for the front two climate control zones. Again, this has a four zone climate control system. You can control the other zones via the infotainment system. This is also where we find the controls for the heated and ventilated front seats. There's a physical direct access button to take you over to the menu system and the infotainment system if you want to control the other zones. Below that, we have more of the shiny black trim matching what we saw on the doors. Behind this little roller, we find a storage compartment along with the USB inputs. So you can see that a larger smartphone just barely fits inside. And then behind this roller compartment, we have two large cup holders and then a small storage cubby. We then have an electric parking brake and the drive mode selector. Since we're driving the plug-in hybrid model, we have a few more drive modes, basically a sport mode, an EV mode, an off-road mode, and then some modes relating to saving the battery or charging the battery. There's also a mode to preserve the battery or charge the battery for later use. We have a padded center armrest, that's leather wrapped of course, and then we have a fairly decently sized storage compartment. The size of the center console is definitely a distinctive difference between this and the Volvo XC90 plug-in hybrid. That center console is a little bit narrower, the vehicle itself is a little bit narrower, and because the batteries are located right here in the center console area, we don't really have much storage going on. On the driver's side, there's a full LCD instrument cluster, but the design is a little bit more simplistic than what we see in some of the luxury competition, especially the Audi competition that has that gorgeous full Google map display. Here we have our pretty typical trip computer information, tire pressure information, a comm screen. There is an on-screen menu here where you can adjust certain things. For instance, if you want the brake coach to show up, oil life, etc. We can also choose this display setup option here. This would allow you to see a few different options in the center of the screen when you're in the normal mode. There are a ton of different things that you can choose from. However, not everything can be displayed at the same time. So for instance, if I were to check power distribution, these are all the options that I can select. I can't also turn on seat belts. If you'd rather, there's also a mode where you don't have a tachometer at all and just a large central speedometer, but it's never gonna be quite as adjustable as some of those other options. No modern luxury car would be complete without a large heads-up display, so we definitely find one here as well. And then we have a three-spoke, two-tone steering wheel. This looks like it's hollow, but it actually is a solid piece right there. They put the voice command button right here in the center of the sport grip. That's my only complaint about the steering wheel. I think that is a little oddly placed. There are paddle shifters on the back. We have up on the right side, down on the left. They are plastic paddles rather than metal paddles. On the left side of the steering wheel, we find infotainment buttons, volume up, down, track, forward, backward, as well as cruise control, enable, disable. Then you notice that these lights then enable themselves once cruise control is on. That way it looks a little bit cleaner when it's not. The lights on the right side of the wheel are also contextually related. So if I click down for the settings option, you'll notice they change there to be OK and back or a home button right there. Otherwise, these function more as direct access buttons. We have a media button right there, phone button, and then a navigation button. Even though the plug-in hybrid aviator is a lot heavier than the regular aviator, you can certainly feel the improvement in acceleration. Zero to 60 happened in this model in 5.1 seconds. Now on the downside, although that is faster than the non-hybrid aviator, it's not as much faster as you might think. With over 600 pound-feet of torque available, it's only about three-tenths of a second faster. It also is a little bit slower, oddly enough, than the Volvo XC90 plug-in hybrid, even though that theoretically has a lot less torque, just about 475 pound-feet in that model. Of course, most folks are going to be buying the non-hybrid version of the aviator, and that version is considerably lighter, much more in keeping with the European competition, and it feels an awful lot like an American BMW X5, and that's definitely a good thing. The Aviator has a strong rear-wheel drive dynamic, even in this plug-in hybrid heavier version, and that's noticeable out on the road. The weight balance of this is excellent. In this platform, the majority of the engine is behind the front axle. That gives us a weight balance very similar to the BMW and the Mercedes, and actually much more advantageous than we find in the Audi Q7, which is actually front heavier than a Volvo XC90. It's likely that the more even weight distribution helped out the braking score. It took 124 feet from this model to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's still a little bit longer than the Volvo XC90, but not as much longer as you might think. That one came in at about 121 feet. In terms of driving dynamics, all aviators are going to feel a little bit more like an X5 or a GLE, but remember that this plug-in hybrid version is pretty heavy, and that certainly affects the handling ability. Power on in the corners, you can certainly feel the rear wheel drive bias in the aviator, and in neutral handling situations, you can certainly feel the good balance of the aviator, but grip is still not going to be where we find a lot of the European competition, including the plug-in hybrid XC90. Now, clearly, the non-hybrid version of the Aviator is going to outhandle the Volvo easily, but when we're talking about plug-in to plug-in, that actually may be better in some situations. If you're looking for something with an isolated ride, the Aviator is going to be an excellent option. This has one of the best rides available in this segment. Now, I am driving the one with the adaptive air suspension, so logically that has an effect on the way the suspension feels. 
As far as adaptive air suspension goes, this is certainly tuned towards the softer side of things in the luxury segment, and sometimes that can make this feel a little ponderous out on the road, a little bit difficult to tell exactly what's going on with all four wheels and tires. And that feeling is certainly different than the air suspension that we find available in the Volvo XC90 or the Mercedes options. Those are tuned a little towards the firmer, more European tuned side of the segment. This definitely has a softer mission in mind. Although I generally prefer a softer suspension tune, I have to admit that I'm a little bit torn about this air suspension. I think I prefer the steel spring setup in the Aviator, and if I were gonna spend money on an Aviator, that's the option that I would get. This air suspension just feels a little bit too soft. Soft to the point where, again, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly what all four wheels and tires are doing. If you were to buy one of these, you'll likely get used to it, but one of the effects of the suspension tune is that it makes the Aviator feel like it doesn't handle as well as it really does, because there's so much body roll and just the suspension motion is a little bit unusual. This is an adaptive air suspension, so I can put it in a firmer mode, but if you do that, then a lot of those small imperfections come into the cabin thanks to the really low profile tires. In my cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, I got 70 decibels even in here, making this one of the quieter entries in the segment. It's a little bit louder in here than in the BMW X5. Of course, I am talking about when the engine is on and we're driving 50 miles an hour. It was just a hair quieter if the engine is off. Speaking about having the engine off, it's now time to talk about this plug-in hybrid system. In my real-world range test, I was able to get 16 miles out of this battery. That puts this an awful lot closer to the Volvo XC90 than it would appear on paper. This is theoretically supposed to give you 21 miles of electric range, the Volvo 18. The Volvo also misses its target, but not by quite as much as the Aviator. Fuel economy has been pretty good. When operating as a hybrid only, I was getting 24 miles per gallon in mixed driving. And according to the trip computer, when leaving the office fully charged, and not charging at home, I've been averaging about 36 miles per gallon. Of course, that's treating the electricity as if it were essentially free. Likely due to the drivetrain design that we find in the Aviator, the XC90 is going to be more efficient when operating as a hybrid. That model easily gets 27 to 28 miles per gallon, but remember, it does not have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, and that is one of the big fuel economy savings that we see in that model. On the flip side, in some situations, that means that this all-wheel drive system is going to be more capable than the all-wheel drive system that we find in the Volvo. Now, Volvo's e-all-wheel drive system is certainly going to be more capable than the Lexus e-all-wheel drive system because it sends more power to the rear axle, but it's never going to be as capable, especially off-road, as a mechanical all-wheel drive system. The Volvo e-all-wheel drive system also results in kind of an unusual feel because it's one of the few vehicles out there that can give you oversteer and torque steer at the same time. If you're in a really tight situation, you crank the wheel all the way to one side and floor it, you'll get both of those things simultaneously. I should mention one more thing about this adaptive air suspension before we go. Unusually, you cannot control the height of this adaptive air suspension separately from the drive mode settings. So if I put this in the deep condition setting, which it says is used for deep snow, off-road conditions, etc., that turns off the trash control system as you would want in those situations, and it raises the air suspension. But there's no simple one button press to raise the air suspension or lower the air suspension, either for easier access or to clear an obstacle. For 2021, the Aviator starts at $51,100. If you want the plug-in hybrid version, which I was driving, then you have to step up to the Grand Touring trim at $68,900. Now remember, that model will qualify for a federal tax credit. The very top end trim of the Aviator at the moment is the Black Label version, and that's going to be about $10,000 more than the plug-in hybrid option, but it doesn't have the plug-in hybrid system. It returns to a regular twin-turbo V6. The Black Label series is part of Lincoln's push to make some of their vehicles more exclusive, obviously more expensive as well, and a bit more customizable than some of the other alternatives that we've traditionally found in the American luxury segment. As a result, when you take a look across the Aviator lineup, we do have a few more color combinations inside and outside, and a few more premium touches is available in the Aviator than we find in probably its most direct competitor, the Cadillac XT6. Clearly, that's where we need to start the comparison section. Now, the XT6 got a pretty big price cut for 2021. That's the big thing to know. It used to start more expensive than the Lincoln Aviator. Cadillac, I think, wisely realized that that was kind of a bad price point for them to be in, so they cut the price tag by nearly $5,000. But there's a bit of a catch. The base version no longer comes with the naturally aspirated V6 engine that we found in the base model for 2020. Instead, it comes with a 2-liter turbocharged engine that is definitely less powerful than the Lincoln Aviator. In fact, there is no version of the XT6 that is as powerful as the base engine that we find in the Lincoln. If you want a V6 in your Cadillac, don't worry, it's still there, but it's going to cost you at least $2,000 more than the base version of the Aviator. 
My problem with the X-T6 is that it's a perfectly fine crossover in a vacuum, and if you really love the way that Cadillacs are styled, then go out and get the X-T6. But there really isn't any particular way in which the X-T6 is better than a Lincoln Aviator, and it will cost just about as much. Top end trims of the X-T6 come in less expensive than the Aviator Black Label, but it's not going to have the same kind of equipment that we find in that Lincoln. If I were to nitpick, I have to say I prefer Cadillac Q to the Lincoln Sync 3 system that we find in the Aviator. Sync 3 is a little bit sluggish, and some of the features aren't as well thought out, I think, as the system that we find in the Cadillac, but the graphics are a little bit more attractive in the Lincoln, and it has a full LCD instrument cluster. Even though it's not my favorite full LCD because it's not as configurable as some of the other options out there, it's certainly more attractive than the regular analog cluster that we find in the X-T6. Bottom line, if you're cross-shopping these models, I would quite simply get the Lincoln Aviator over the Cadillac. One of Cadillac's selling points in the past has been its Americanness, and one of the reasons you wouldn't buy something like a BMW X5 over the X-T6 in certain areas of the country is because you wanted to buy the American product. But that's where the Lincoln steps in because it is sort of that American BMW X5 in some ways. Bottom line, if you're cross-shopping the Cadillac and the Lincoln, I would quite simply buy the Lincoln. Next up, we have the BMW X5. The Lincoln Aviator reminds me a decent amount of the X5, or really sort of somewhere between an X5 and an X7. The Aviator is a bit bigger than the X5, a little bit smaller than the X7. The interior dimensions are somewhere in that in-between as well. The Aviator certainly has a strong rear-wheel drive dynamic, and it's available as a two-wheel drive vehicle as well. So if you're interested in having a rear-wheel drive luxury crossover, this is the only American option that's going to suffice. But Lincoln also decided to tune the Aviator a little bit towards the softer side of things. So if you're looking for a softer alternative to some of the German options, then the Aviator could be a good choice as well. Really, the key difference between the Aviator and something like the X5 is that we simply don't have the upper end models in the Lincoln lineup that we do find in the BMW line. BMW has the M50i version, they have the X5M, of course, and there are no corollaries in the Lincoln lineup. The Lincoln Aviator plug-in hybrid certainly gives you more oomph, but it does leave a little bit to be desired when it comes to refinement, and performance is really not going to be far removed from the regular twin-turbo V6 that we find in the Lincoln Aviator. To be perfectly honest, I wouldn't buy the plug-in hybrid version of the Lincoln. I think there are just a few too many compromises, and it ends up feeling an awful lot heavier out on the road. I would quite simply just get the base twin-turbo engine. But that base twin-turbo engine is an excellent competitor to something like the BMW X5. There are a number of logical reasons to buy it over the BMW. It has a roomier interior, it definitely has a lower sticker price than we find in comparably equipped versions of the BMW. And this is the first Lincoln in quite some time that really does have the dynamic ability to compete very directly with some of the Germans. The platform that the Aviator is built on is really an excellently tuned platform. It has a great rear wheel drive dynamic, it feels good out on the road, it feels very much like the European competition. But again, slightly different in that it's tuned towards the softer side of things, but it still is in that same family and quite different from something like a Lexus RX, which is much softer, much more isolated, doesn't handle nearly as well as the Lincoln. Now let me digress and talk about the hybrid system a little bit more. The fuel economy I thought was a little bit disappointing. I had expected a bigger bump over the regular model. Honestly, there's not going to be too much difference for a lot of folks out there. Yes, it will switch some of your consumption over to electricity, but I'm not quite sure it's worth the trade-off in terms of drivetrain smoothness. The plug-in hybrid system is just not as smooth as the plug-in hybrid system in, for instance, the Volvo XC90. And the Volvo XC90 is going to be less expensive at $63,450 for 2021. Volvo has renamed that the XC90 Recharge from the XC90 T8. The odd thing that surprised me is that the XC90 plug-in hybrid system is also going to be faster 0 to 60 than the plug-in hybrid system in the Aviator, even though the performance figures, as far as the drivetrain goes, seem like the Aviator should be a little bit faster. I think the big reason for that is curb weight. The Aviator plug-in hybrid is really fairly heavy. As a result of that curb weight increase, the Aviator plug-in hybrid is not going to have much of a dynamic improvement over the XC90 when it comes to the on-road manners. Again, I would quite simply get the regular non-hybrid version of the Aviator. The XC90 is also going to be more fuel efficient when operating as a hybrid. You'll get several MPG more in the XC90 even if you choose to never plug it in at all. Now on the downside, the XC90 does get an E all-wheel drive system, so that's going to put an electric motor on the rear axle rather than the mechanical all-wheel drive system that we find in the Lincoln Aviator. So in general terms, the Aviator is going to be more capable in some stickier situations if you planned on taking your crossover a little bit off-road, very mild off-roading of course, or if you planned on driving your vehicle into deeper snow. The all-wheel drive system in the Lincoln is going to be able to handle that a little bit better than the one in the XC90. 
At this point, if you're simply looking for a plug-in hybrid luxury crossover, I would get the Volvo XC90. It definitely comes ahead of the Lincoln in terms of system smoothness and system performance as well. Next up, we have the Mercedes-Benz GLE. Similar thoughts here to the BMW X5 comparison. Driving dynamics are going to be quite similar. I think that the Mercedes does have some nicer interior components than we find in the Lincoln Aviator, but wow, it's going to be an awful lot more expensive, especially if you get carried away with options. At the moment, there's no direct corollary to the AMG versions of the Mercedes-Benz GLE in the Lincoln lineup. And again, that plug-in hybrid system does not deliver the kind of performance that I had really expected out of it in the Aviator. But on the other hand, most folks aren't buying the AMG versions of the GLE, and if you're shopping for the regular editions of the GLE, then you should definitely put the Lincoln on your list. And that's really my bottom line for the Aviator overall, is that aside from the towing ability in the Aviator, which I was a little bit disappointed by, Every other area the Lincoln Aviator has really delivered exactly what I was hoping out of a new rear-wheel drive Lincoln crossover. The Aviator is handsome inside and outside, it has a good amount of standard power, a lot of standard features, and it's very well priced. If you're shopping for a luxury three-row crossover at this moment, the Aviator should definitely be on your list. And because I definitely like a deal, I would probably get the Aviator over entries like the GLE or the BMW X5 at this exact moment. But keep in mind, this segment is heating up and there are a ton of great options out there. If you're interested in a plug-in hybrid, again, there's the XC90. I would certainly take that over the plug-in hybrid version of the Lincoln Aviator, and we also have the upcoming Genesis GV80. It's not quite the same size inside as the Aviator, but I think it has an even nicer interior. And of course, Genesis is going in the same direction as Lincoln and Mercedes and BMW by giving us a rear wheel drive entry, uh, not a front wheel drive entry like we find in the Lexus RX. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and let me know what you think about the Lincoln infotainment system. I think that's one of the weak points in the Lincoln interior at the moment is that the infotainment system does feel a little bit sluggish. I wish it was a more modern system. And the instrument cluster in the Aviator, although it is an attractive full LCD cluster, I wish it did a little bit more than we see in the current Lincoln models. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section. Find me over at Facebook, over at Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.